I am just going to tell you, I've known John for a season. We won't talk about how long seasons are, but it's been a while. And uh, as God is my witness, I've been in lots of services, but I've never been with anybody who can lead us into the presence of God through song better than John Duncan. Amen? What an amazing, amazing gift that God has gifted you with. And more importantly, what an amazing heart that you have in sharing that gift. And I so appreciate the opportunity to be uh, here again. Uh, wasn't it wonderful to see Pastor Griff on the video? Uh, it's even going to be more wonderful to see him in person. Griff and Sherry and I uh, and Cindy, we go back a ways. We had dinner together not just a couple of three weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, I guess. And uh, they were so excited about what God is uh, doing in their lives and bringing them to this place. And I am excited for you. Uh, I know uh, Griff and Sherry are just wonderful, wonderful uh, people, but what a great pastor he has been in all the places that he has served, and what a great pastor's wife she has been. You're in for a great season, a great blessing that God is uh, bestowing upon you as a church, and I'm just excited that y'all uh, are going to have that opportunity uh, to uh, grow together, uh, serve together, and lead together. So uh, what, what a great thing. Thank you for the opportunity to get to be with you again. Um, uh, I, I must not have been a way of stopping it. Y'all, y'all, your voices must not have been heard. But I, I am glad to be here, and uh, it, it is good to be in God's house. You know, um, I love, I don't know about you, but I love a lot of different sports. But more than any other time, I love the Olympics. Do you, do you enjoy the Olympics? I like the Summer Olympics. I like the Winter Olympics. I like Special Olympics. In fact, the last couple of three days, uh, Cindy teaches uh, special needs at Putnam City West, and she has a team, and I had the privilege of going uh, this year and every year uh, as a, uh, to Special Olympics with her, and I need to clarify, I go as a sponsor, not a contestant, and just in case you were wondering. And um, it, it is just an exciting thing because here's all the, all the best of the best, and they're competing together, and they're sharing their, their passions together. And there's just a lot of things that happen there that, that are really unique. And so I have used uh, illustrations from uh, the Olympics and messages that I've preached, and I've never had any of them backfire until this one day in South Carolina. I am sitting in the middle of South Carolina, the humidity capital of America. There, there is a snow about every 10 years. Not a winter sports capital by no means. And I am in the midst of preaching this message, and I'm talking about how we can become prideful and arrogant about the craziest things. It doesn't take much for man to be prideful. In fact, I said, there is somebody out there in the world today that owns a gold medal because they could sweep ice better than anybody else, so somebody could slide a stone on ice, and they are like, wow, look at us. We're the best. There, nobody can sweep ice better than me. Nobody can push a rock better than me. This is great. That's, that's the ability of man to be arrogant about the silliest things. I thought it was a great illustration until one of my dear deacon friends came running up to me after the service and goes, what were you thinking? And I said, I don't know what, 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 about which part? And he said, why did you use curling as your illustration today? And I said, it fit the message? I mean... What am I supposed to say? And he goes, of all the days that you could do that, today was the absolute worst day. I said, I said, why? And he said, my daughter-in-law was here today. 
for 10 years, we've been trying to get her to come to our church, to just come to church. And they're visiting us this week, and I convinced her that she would love our church and that she would like our pastor. And you gave that illustration. And I said, still don't get it. Her dad is the curling coach for the Canadian Winter Olympics. <laughs> well, from that moment on, I had determined that it is possible for me to stick my foot in my mouth, regardless of what the situation is. And I kind of swore off giving Olympic illustrations, but... There's just one that I just absolutely love. I don't know if it's true or if it's folklore, but it's worth saying. I, do you all remember when Peekaboo Street was skiing in the Winter Olympics for the U.S.? And when she got back to Utah, they wanted to uh, honor her in some way in her very small town that she lived. And they were building onto the hospital and they named the ICU at the hospital in the town that she uh, grew up in, you had way ahead of me. Peekaboo, I see you. Okay. All that has nothing to do with my message. But it was my segue into our passage this morning in Mark chapter 11. Because what we're going to find here is Jesus illustrating the I see you needs of the church today. So if you take your Bibles and look in Mark chapter 11, we will come together there and read God's Word, beginning in chapter 11, beginning in verse 12. The Word of the Lord comes to us and says this. The next day, when they went from Bethany, he was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree with leaves, he went to find out there was any, if there was anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season of the figs. He said to it, May no one ever eat fruit from, your, from you again. And his disciples heard it. They came to Jerusalem, and he went into the temple, and he began to throw out those buying and selling. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves, and would not permit anyone to carry goods through the temple. He was teaching them, it is, not, is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of thieves. The chief priest and the scribes heard it and started looking for ways to kill him, for they were afraid of him because of the whole crowd which was astonished by his teachings. Whenever evening came, they would go out from that city. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. And I pray that you would just help your word come to life for us today. And help us to apply it, not just corporately, but help us to apply it individually. That, that we might be all that you desire us to be. And we might experience all that you have for us to experience. And that our lives, each one, individually, and then gathered together corporately as the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, the church... Father, would be a, a light to a dark world. And Father, it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. And what we find is that David in Psalms 84.1 uh, 84, says, How beloved is the tabernacle of the Lord Most High. I, I, I think that we need to put in perspective here that Jesus is not doing what he's doing as a fit of anger, but, but because of his great love and his compassion for the church. We, we ought to love the church. We ought to love the church because of what the church is and what the church represents and what the church means to us in our own lives. I don't know about you, but so much of my story revolves around the church. It, it, was, it was there where I had the opportunity to hear about God's plan for my life. It was in the church that I heard the gospel for the very first time. 
It was there that I had the opportunity to make my profession of my faith in Jesus Christ. It was in the church that I stood in front of the church in water and I was baptized, buried with Christ and raised in newness of life and I made a testimony, my first public testimony of my relationship with Christ. It wasn't long before God began to call me to preach. It wasn't much longer than before God allowed the church to ordain me into the gospel ministry. Hey, if you didn't hear anything else, it was in the church that I met my wife. Amen? Uh, that's a great place to meet a wife. And it was in the church that we got married. It was in the church that one day I will be buried. I, I, I'm going, Cindy, you hear that. I, I don't want to go to the funeral home. The church is the place where I want to be laid to rest. Because the church is central to my own personal story of life. Jesus desires for us to have a relationship with him and his bride. And it is the church, then, the bride of Christ, that brings us this great compassion. It's the church. The church is so much part of who I am that... I really have lost the ability to understand what people outside of the church do to get through life. I'm, I mean, I, I'm just disconnected from that. I don't, I don't know how people who do not have a church family get through the hard times of life. I, I can remember a time where I was in western Oklahoma and there was this couple. They, they were the sweetest godliest couple that I had ever had the opportunity to meet and she had developed cancer in her late 80s and they had been married for so long and he he showed me by his example what a godly husband was to be and and so they were mentors to my life even though I didn't call them that publicly I, I watched them and observed them and I was so moved by their love for each other and their love for Jesus and and I get called back to that, to that waiting area, that staging area, before they go into surgery. Now, it always amazes me that I can't, if I don't know your middle name and the last four digits of your social security number, I'm probably not going to be able to find out what room you're in at the hospital. But then when you're in that most Im immediate, intimate time, uh, just before you go back to surgery, all they do is put curtains up between you, right? So you got people on either side of you, and they're talking. Doctors are talking. You're hearing that and this. Well, we're standing there, and, and, um, and I'm standing with this couple, and I said, L let me pray with you, uh, and, and then I'll slip out so that uh, the doctor will be coming soon. And so I just prayed a prayer of hope over this couple. And I started out, and when I slipped out the curtain, an arm came out of the curtain next to me and grabbed me and pulled me inside the room. And he said, Sir, I don't know who you are. And I know I wasn't supposed to hear what you said. But my wife and I have never been to church. And there's a good chance that this is the last time that we are ever going to be able to talk together because the surgery that she's about to have does not give us a lot of hope. I was wondering, is there any way you could pray for us the way you prayed for them? And of course, I gladly did. But it just brought back to me how important the bride of Christ is to our life. That's why we're in community groups. That's why we're in small group. That's why we're in Sunday school, whatever you want to call it. That's why we do that so that together we can know each other and we can care for each other and we can support each other, not just in the hard times, but also in the good times to celebrate with, to, to have joy and and favor and fellowship with it is the plan of God that that the church would be community and that the church would be a place where we had all of this it is the church that 
that we should be jealous for. And this church that we should have great, great love for. So when we come to this passage, Jesus is demonstrating for us this great love. You see, the problem that we, that we find here is that the problem of the fig tree was that it was green and promising on the outside, but it wasn't doing what it was supposed to be doing. It wasn't producing fruit. It was green, it was promising, it, 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 it should be able to produce fruit, but it was taking all of the nutrients and all of its resources to grow itself and to grow its beauty, but it, but it had not produced fruit. I, I want you to know there are churches all over America today that look amazing from the outside. They, they look amazing inside. They, they have all the, the most beautiful decorations that any church could want. They may even be filled with lots and lots of people. And activities going from one side of the room to the other. Always busy, always at work, always doing things. But missing the main thing. There are churches that have... Bowling and softball and pickleball and daycares and cookbooks and on and on and on. And listen to me, there's nothing wrong with any of those things. But there is a purpose for everything the church does. And that is to produce fruit. We shouldn't be involved in anything that doesn't ultimately bring people into an opportunity to have a relationship with the God that we serve. When Jesus looked at this tree, I, I imagine in my mind's eye that he was looking at that tree and thinking about the church the way Van Gogh, looking out of his window in the asylum in which he was, down on the city, that little narrow window gave him a view of the city below. And Van Gogh would look out on that city and he would paint the picture, Star Starry Night. One of the most famous paintings of all times. And I wish I had time to unpack all the symbolism that Van Gogh had in that painting it is very ripe with his expression and and experience in the church you see if you don't know this van gogh at one time was a missionary he he was trying to do the work of the gospel he, he was sacrificing his time his energy his resources and able to advance the gospel but he kept running into opposition. And the opposition that he ran into was not in the world. It was the church wanting to stop him, hold him back, just kind of box him in a little bit. And so by the time that Van Gogh now was just tormented by all of these thoughts and all of these expressions and the depression that, that came upon his life, he's now in this asylum and he's looking out and he paints the city. And when you look at that picture, you're going to notice that, that there, there in the city, one of the prominent images in the city is the church. And when you look at the church you'll see that there are no lights on at the church. But if you look at some of the houses, a few of the houses, not the majority, but a few, you'll see that there's a light on in some of those houses. And Van Gogh, in that painting, was illustrating that in many churches the light of the gospel had gone out. But God still had a remnant in the city. 
in the homes of those who were true believers and followers of Jesus Christ. We should not, under our watch, allow the church to lose its lamp, to lose its light, to lose its purpose for being. And Jesus says to the fig tree, you are cursed because you have not produced that which you were designed to produce. I, I, I can say this as an outsider. It might sound arrogant if somebody from inside the church said it, but I can say this to you because it is my job, sort of, to know the conditions of churches in Oklahoma. And I do know the conditions of a lot of churches in Oklahoma. And, I, and from my heart, I would say to you that you are a great church in our state. You have a great history and legacy. You have in the past been a powerful light in this community. And you have been an example to our state. And you have the potential in the future of being even more than what you have been. And God has great plans and has a design for you to prosper, not so that you are prosperous, but that the kingdom of God would be advanced. You have that ability, and you have the opportunity if you keep the main thing, the main thing, and that is the gospel being promoted in everything that we do. And Jesus comes in verses 15 through 19, and he comes to the temple. And, and when he gets to the temple, he, he, has this, he has this experience. Now, he's not, he's not just coming in there and seeing it for the first time and, and, and experiencing what was going on for the very first No, Jesus made a habit of going to the temple. This was not something that was, was unaware to him. He was very much aware. But his timing of this being the Monday before the cross was was bearing down on the situation and Jesus wants to illustrate that the condition of the temple had become something different than what it was intended to be. His actions were to illustrate without question God's dissatisfaction with the church. It had become two things. One, it had become a place of exclusion rather than inclusion. Exclusive may be the ugliest word in all of the English language. That we are exclusive, especially when it comes to the church. It, it should not be something that we, that we garner, but something that we resist. The church should be inclusive, not exclusive. It's something to guard against. I... I, I've served as pastor in several places, and it, it, it always interests me at who is and isn't allowed. You say, wait, how would anybody not be allowed? Well, they might make it through the door, right? But they know that they're not actually being seen in the room. They're not part of what's going on. There, there are people pointing at them and making comments about them, but not, but not reaching out to them. When I, when I was pastor, my my first pastorate actually, we took some kids to camp, and and one of the kids that went to camp with us was an African American young man, and and he got gloriously saved and he was going to be baptized with the other kids in our church and and I was so excited and I got there on Saturday and I filled up the the tank and and I put we had like a little cattle prod type thing that we stuck down in there to warm it up and I was so excited and he was going to be one of the kids baptized the next day I got there and the kids that were going to be baptized were coming in and and he wasn't there and I asked somebody to call him and and so they did, and they came back and reported to me that our chairman of deacons had gone to his grandfather and told his grandfather that the community had helped them build their church. 
in their part of the town. And that there was no need for their church to have one of theirs baptized in our church. I wish that was a long time ago, but it wasn't that long ago. I would go out into community around the last church that I pastored in, in the south. And I would invite the neighborhood to come to the church. And you know what? Um, knock on the door, and I invited this sweet lady and her children to come to our church. And she looked at me, and she just kind of looked at me. And she said, now you're talking about that church that's just down the street. And she described right where we were. And I said, yes. And she just said, well, I'm just going to ask you. And I said, well, okay, what, what is it? She said, can black people go to that church? You could, you could have, you could have shot me with a bazooka. I mean, it just, it just tore a hole inside of me. And you know what? The, what, what really burdened me was the church had for years, it's a hundred something years old, for years, it had been exclusive. And the answer to her question would have been no. And then only about 20 years earlier, it had become yes if you sat in the back. And then it would have been okay, but don't try to join. And now here with open arms, we're saying, come be a part. And she said, can we? Now, it's easy for us to think that's a race issue. For in that moment it was. But, but our exclusiveness as church is not always based on race, is it? People who don't go to the same places that we go, don't dress the same way that we dress, don't have the same likes that we have. They, you know, they, they, they're just different. You know, there should be nobody come to the church that doesn't have an audience of people who would surround them and love them and envelop them into the body of Christ, into the body of this fellowship. Because where else are they going to hear the gospel if we don't give them the gospel when they come through our doors? And so there are all kinds of peoples, people groups, right here in your own community that are literally going unreached because they don't necessarily fit the idea of our churches. The scripture here, Jesus says, My house shall be a house of prayer for all nations. That word nations is for all peoples. It, it can't be exclusive, and it, and it can't be a place of consumerism. And consumerism is not just commercialism, but, but it's more than that. It's, the, it, it's, it's more intriguing than that. It, it's, it's our likes and our dislikes. It, it's what we prefer. Rather than being focused on God, they, this kind of church becomes focused on themselves. And so they want what they want the way that they want it in, in, the, in the preference to plans of their own thinking. And so they become places of consumerism. So when you get in the car and you go home today, somebody's likely to say, what do you think about the service today? And somebody's likely to say, oh, the music was great. I love those hymns. <gasps> or they might say, oh, the service was great. I love those praise songs. 
Or they might say, oh, the service was great because the energy was wonderful. And I just love an, a, 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 an energized service. Or, or they might say, well, I'm just going to say, the sermon, well, it was interesting. And you know, that could be anything. That could be nice or mean. I don't know. Or you, or you might just say, well, we got out on time. <laughs> That's the number one evaluation of how good a service is, by the way. Well, I wonder how many of us, myself included, don't, 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 don't misunderstand. I'm not just preaching to a crowd. I'm preaching to myself as well. How many of us reflect on the service and ask ourselves, did God move? Did the Spirit of God show up in our worship today? Did we produce fruit as a congregation? I grew up at First Southern Dell City, and my pastors were John Bazzano and Jimmy Draper and Bailey Smith, and all three of those guys were unique and different kind of fellows. No doubt about it. They all had different strengths and weaknesses, and they had different emphasis, and they were all of that. But when I was growing up, and I started going to church. Occasionally, my mom would take me when I was uh, around first grade. I never went to a church service, whether it was a Sunday morning, a Sunday night, a Wednesday night, or a revival night. I never went to a church service until I was in college. In which somebody did not get saved. And I never went to a service that somebody did not get baptized. Not one time. So I had a pretty skewed opinion of what was supposed to happen in church. I actually thought people were supposed to get saved when the word was preached. And people were supposed to get baptized after they got saved. Boy, what a messed up opinion I had of the church. And so when I went to college, I went to the first church, and, and, and uh, the guy preached a, a great message, and we had great singing, and, and he gave an invitation, and, and nobody went forward. And I thought, hmm, i got to find another church. Obviously, the Spirit of God does not reside here. Six churches later, I decided I'm just going to have to pick one. I'm just going to have to pick one. And I did. I started thinking to myself, what made First Southern so great? I mean, John Bazzano, Jimmy Draper, Bailey Smith, excellent preachers of the word. But that's not, that's not what was happening. Well, that was important. It wasn't the sum total of what was happening. Aubie McSwain, oh my soul, what a great worship leader he was. But that wasn't the sum total of what was happening. Do you know that I started thinking back about all of that time, and not only could I not remember a service, and, and I know it to be true, there was not a service in which somebody did not get saved and baptized, but I, I also... Never saw anybody walk to the front of that auditorium without a church member walking with them. And the people who got saved on Sunday morning were not the people that came in and heard the wonderful sermon. 
But the people who got saved on Sunday morning were the people that their neighbor had been sharing the gospel with during their times of communicating over the fence or somebody that they had worked with or somebody they had gone to school with. And not a single person do I remember coming down that aisle having walked into the church for the first time, having heard the gospel for the first time, and then come and join and be baptized. No, they were there because the people in the pew were doing the witnessing of the gospel every single day. That's why in Acts chapter 2, it says, and daily the Lord were adding to their numbers those who were being saved. It wasn't because of the preaching. It was because of the proclamation of the pew. And so when we come to church, we ought to be praying, God, please move in our service today. Move in my life today. Speak to me. Empower me to be your witness this week. Lord, if I don't have fruit to come to bear today, God, give me fruit this week that I might bring with me those who are being saved. I think you can be a great church. I think you are a great church. And I think you can even be greater. But here's what I need you to know. Griff is not your savior. Griff is not the answer to whatever questions you have about your church. Griff is not the, does not have the ability to change whatever you want changed in your church. Are you hearing me? You know what Griff has? He has the heart of a man of God who will humbly pray and he will humbly lead this church to be a house of prayer for all peoples. And in doing so, he will watch you rise up as the church and become fruitful in all that you do as a congregation because the purpose of the church is that we will be called a house of prayer for all peoples and what does prayer do it brings us into fellowship with God and that's what this invitation is about today do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? I hope you do. But if you want to know the fullness of God's plan for your life, there are going to be men standing here to receive you when the invitation is offered in just a moment. After I pray, if you want to give yourself to that, I pray that you will come and do that. But more importantly, I want you to hear me. I, I hope that there are people who will do that. But I also hope that in this pew, in these chairs, where you are, that you'll be the person who will say, you know what, Father? I want to be a fruit bearer and not just a vine. I want to bear fruit for the kingdom of God. And if that is who you are, I want you to say that to the Lord in prayer today. And I promise you this, he will make you that. Let's stand to our feet. Father, in these few minutes that we have remaining, as your Holy Spirit has drawn us unto you today, I pray for those who have never answered the call of salvation. While your Spirit is drawing them, they have resisted, but I pray that they would put aside their resistance and today embrace your love and embrace you as the leader of their life and that they would commit themselves to you and they'd come and let one of these men know what you have done in their life or what they desire for you to do in their life and they will help with that decision and God I pray earnestly that all across this all across this auditorium that your Holy Spirit would be raising up young men, young women, old men, old women, and everything in between, raising us up 
to say, God, I don't want to just be an attender. I don't want to just fill a pew or a spot in a chair. But God, I want to be your servant. I want to be empowered by your spirit. And I want to bear much fruit for your glory. And I want my church to be a church that is famous for the gospel and its power to save. Hear these prayers, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. As God's Spirit has spoken, you come. Hey, thank you for joining us online today. We hope that the Lord spoke to your heart through this message. If you would like to speak to someone today about a decision you feel led to make or for someone to pray with you, please call our church offices. We have somebody that would love to talk with you. For more information about Chisholm Heights, please check out our website at chbcmustang.org. We hope that you will join us again in person or online next week.